great to see you here on All Access Live with Kevin Rankin. Thank you for being here on a Friday. Hopefully you're all prepared for Super Bowl. You've got your uh, your picks in, and if you're not a football fan, it uh, it doesn't matter. You've got great entertainment right here. Make sure you come back here Monday as well. At the same time, I will have Paul Antonelli, an Emmy Award-winning uh, songwriter, musician, ex bandmate of mine from Animotion way back in the day. So he'll be here Monday at 5 o'clock Pacific, 8 o'clock Eastern. And also, if you're coming here anywhere from other than YouTube, please do me a favor and go to the link below. Go to youtube.com slash at access Kevin. Make sure you subscribe, like this video, and sure, I sure would appreciate it if you share it. Uh, you can also become a member. And if you join the channel, you'll have access to a few members only exclusive videos that I've done interviews with Kelly Kigi from his place in uh, Phoenix. You know him as the singing drummer from Night Ranger. Um, he's also a, a Grammy Award winner and platinum record owner. Uh, Cy Kernan from The Fix and uh, mid -Year are also exclusive members only interviews. And uh, it would sure help me out as this next organization has as well. Based in Beaverton, Oregon, Five Star Guitars is a fantastic guitar shop, but they also have repairs, they do lessons, uh, they do online lessons uh, from pros like Jennifer Batten. So if you go to fivestarguitars.com slash all access live, you're going to find several pages of products that are a valuable discount. And they also have a promo code that you can use at checkout called all access 15 that gives you 15% off of everything you see. And the beauty is that there's no sales tax in Oregon. So you're going to save a ton of dough by ordering online. So make sure you go to fivestargutars.com slash all access live. Now, my next guest is uh, an amazing songwriter. Um, he's also an award-winning songwriter. He's had a lot of uh, co-writing that he's done with uh, folks. He was a Portlander, that's where I first got to see him. And then he has relocated to Nashville where he's made all sorts of impact on uh, music industry. He teaches some songwriting, and uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that and the rest of the beauty in Craig Carruthers right here. Craig, how you doing, buddy? Hey, man, good to see you, Kevin. Hey, I um, I've talked to a lot of people about your migration from Portland to Nashville because the interesting thing about most people's stories is that um, they go to Nashville with these aspirations of being a songwriter. They get out there and they realize uh, without many sort of personal contacts, uh, it's a pretty scary spot. And they come back with a tail between their legs. <laughs> it, it, you know, you uh, not only did you go out there and uh, kick ass and take names, but it seems like you really established and made a name for yourself. So did you have hookups when you went out? That's what I'm curious about. Well, I, I have a kind of a different view of it than that. I think that it's a personality type. Okay. Um, I think that some people, you know, let's say you're a guitar player and you and you go to Los Angeles and you go someplace and you hear a guitar player that just in your mind puts you to shame. Some people check out of their hotel the next day and go home. Yeah, right. Other people, it, it really lays them low and they wake up the next morning and they go, I'm going to get better. I'm going to try harder. Yeah. And I'm kind of of that school. When I first took my trip, first trip here, I didn't really know anybody. I mean, I knew a couple of people here. Dave Berg was here and he was a, used to be a Portlander also. Um, and, uh, and then I went to, I went to a couple of songwriter showcases and the people it, it's weird because there's the official export of Nashville that the thing you might hear on the radio or the bands that are famous. And then there's this sort of underground, if you will, of songwriters who maybe have a cut here and there, but they are, really kind of more in, of my ilk, you know, folky Americana singer songwriter, kind of pop influenced. Um, and they came here to see whether or not they could have some success as a national songwriter. And most of us didn't really have that much success as national songwriters, had a few songs recorded maybe, but we found this community. Yeah. You know, I moved here and I met Don Henry, who's a brilliant songwriter and a Grammy winner and Angela Cassett and Tony Rada, who wrote The Dance, and Kim Ritchie. And there's this, it's a, almost like a singer-songwriter haven here. And that's a different kind of a different group than the people who are really, as you say, kicking ass and taking names uh, in, the, in the industry itself. My publishing deal was over within the first year of after moving here. Really? I, I, I got signed in 95, and I used to take trips every year while still living in Portland. And we moved here in 2000. It's crazy. That's almost 25 years ago. 
Um, and within a year, Universal bought my company and anybody who was not having top of the charts got dropped. Mm -hmm. So what that led me to was I thought I was shifting gears and sort of concentrating on songwriting, but then I had to start figuring out how to gig to survive. And certainly I took a lot of trips back to Portland, but there's not, you can't really play for a living here like you can't play for a living in LA. Mm -hmm. So it caused me to start exploring gig options in other places. And, you know, uh, Columbus is a five hour drive away and Atlanta is a four hour drive away and Birmingham is a three hour drive away. And I never thought about this before I was here, but Tennessee touches eight or nine other states and you've got a lot of these, you know, there's an unbelievable number of mid-size to large cities, uh, every direction from Nashville. So it, it became, it really was the impetus for me to start exploring other markets after having spent most of my time playing in Portland before that. When I first saw you in Portland, uh, I had just moved out from Montana and I, um, I helped some friends move and I was really interested in maybe moving to Seattle, but I discovered just the vibe in Portland was so much different. And I think within the first two weeks that I moved, uh, my wife at the time and I went to the Aladdin to see Jeffrey Gaines and Paula Cole and uh, this opening act were Craig Carruthers and Tim Ellis. And, uh, and you know, it's one of those gigs where the opening act was put on probably at seven o'clock, you know, yeah. and then uh, headliners on at nine 30. Right. So you've got, and, and we've all seen, you know, you've all expected to go to see a headlining show and you think, Oh man, I'm going to sit through a couple of hours of these openers. I hope to God they're good. And I'll never forget the first time I heard little Hercules, that song absolutely put goosebumps on, you know, hair in my arm stood up and, um, it, the hook was there when I mean, the, the song has such an incredible hook, but the delivery was, it was fantastic. I mean, the, the, there was this chemistry that you had with Tim that uh, is so rare, you know, it, it's, it just yeah. blows my mind how, how you guys would play off each other. And it, honestly, it didn't seem like you were doing a concert so much as it was, it was there for you guys. It really felt like we were in your living room, you know? Well, you're not wrong. Tim and I had, and I, the thing is, I think he made a lot of people feel this way. Um, but from the first time he was playing in a group with Greg Williams called the three humans. And, uh, Greg was in my band at that time. And he said, Hey, uh, I want to invite the guitar player that I'm playing with. I want him to, to, to sit in. And Tim came and sat in with us. <laughs> I remember saying like after one set, want to join the band. <laughs> yeah, right. He's, he was so amazing at finding a way to belong in every setting. And that's why he was like the most in demand cat. Right. He was, you know, the leader of his church band and he was playing and working in the studio with everybody and playing with singer songwriters and playing with Michael Harrison with jazz act and just, just had such an incredibly positive, upbeat attitude and just an affinity to play the perfect thing on songs he had never heard, right? which was like a magic trick. Yeah. So, no, you're absolutely right. Cause we would just have a gas whenever we played together and it, it, it was a bonus if the audience was listening. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny guys. I've tried to explain that to some people about corporate gigs that we did. You know, we would do like New Year's Eve gigs where you'd play country clubs and nobody really wanted to hear live music. You know, you were no. there because you were, you were, you know, they, they had to have live music. So they'd pay the band. And as soon as I'd carry drums in, they'd say, Oh no, 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 no. We don't need drums. But all of those gigs were just a comedy fest, you know, because Tim would have a sarcastic way to sort of deliver lines that were biting and they might actually jab at some of the, you know, the bougie people without really making them understand that they were being laughed at. But the one thing that he had that a lot of people, I, I've not seen people replicate, he, he played like this monstrous virtuoso on electric guitar, but he was doing a lot of stuff with acoustic. He'd have incredible, he, incredible he, acoustic he, player. Incredible acoustic player. So when you guys first started doing that gig, when, when Greg brought you in, I never got to see with Greg. Um, I saw you right out. As soon as you did that gig, there was another in-store show that you did at Pioneer Courthouse Square. You played upstairs in the music store there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I um, this is long before like sort of commercial websites were happening. This is like 1994. And uh, I remember asking around, like, how do I find these guys again? I was so drawn to want to come and see you play again. And um, the 
I, I believe that was it. It was either there or Borders music, but it was a small in-store music. You know, yeah, down, we down definitely down did quite a few Borders shows. And you guys together, because you're a phenomenal, accomplished guitarist as well. So did you sort of fashion yourself as like a, a soloist at that point? Or, or did that inspire you, know, you to? No, I played, you know, when I first started out, I just was playing, you know, um, I think one of my started, I went to University of Oregon to as an English major. Okay. And I started writing songs and it just took over my life. Now, it's not too, you know, apple from the tree. My parents were public school music teachers. But I didn't want to be a musician. I didn't want to follow in the family business, so to speak. I didn't want to be a teacher. And so my rebellion was to be an English major with a, with a theater minor when I went to University of Oregon. But then I, I just started writing songs all the time. It just sort of took over my life. So most of my early playing from then up through the 80s, for, you know, for probably six or seven years, was all just me and acoustic guitar. All my gigs were solo gigs. Okay. Um, and then I had a couple of bands, and and then I had a band where I was a bass player with Dan Brandt and Kip Richardson called Go Ninety. Um, and then the next time I had a band, it was the I think er, in the early days it was Gary Ogan and um, uh, John Bunzo and I, and then Brian Davis joined the band, and then you know all the personnel switches up, and then at some point Greg started playing with us, and then it was. Greg and Gary and and John left and Tim was in and um, but Tim and I were doing acoustic duo gigs all during that time because that was still I still had a, you know, irons in that fire those those shows whether it was a place like Aldo's or the Buffalo Gap places where I could always get an acoustic gig and the funny thing about playing with Tim was in the early days I think I had more orchestrated if if I thought, if that's not too pretentious of a way to describe it more orchestrated guitar players got parts because i was playing by myself uh, yeah. and when i started playing with tim he became the color guy and i started playing simpler just to make room for that and then <laughs> years later like when i i moved to nashville i was doing a lot of solo gigs and i go man i got a shed i can't just sit here and go jing 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 yeah. jing i gotta do something more interesting because i don't have tim spicing right. it up yeah but, well if Jim Walker was the same kind of thing, you know, when I saw him playing a lot with Tim, I know it inspired him to to want to sort of up his game on guitar as well. But um, those those early gigs, you talked about the Buffalo Gap in Portland, and I certainly saw you play a bunch of gigs there. And um, guys, if you're watching this and you have not been to sort of a songwriters in the round environment, uh, you know, the first person I ever thought of really when I heard about that sort of terminology or that concept was you. Because you kind of led a lot of the songwriters in the round that I saw. And even if it wasn't that you were supposed to be the leader, it seemed like that was well, a natural thing for you. Well, what happened was I came, I, I took a trip to Nashville in 95 and I attended a songwriters in the round and they really started here. Was and, that Bluebird? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I thought, man, I know a lot of great songwriters. I'm going to, I'm going to see, I had a great relationship with Kink at the time. I'm going to see if the Buffalo Gap will let me do it on Tuesday nights. I'm going to do it with no amplification, and they don't charge a cover charge. But uh, I'm going to I'm going to ask them. I want to run it that way and run a cover charge, and then and and the perk will be I think I can get Kink. We'll do it every other Tuesday. I think I can get Kink to have me on with one other songwriter every time we do that show, and and it was like that for a couple of years, nice. and we cultivated a thing. We had a line out the door. Yeah. And so many cool people played that. E even songwriters who you've really only seen in the context of their bands came and played. You know, Tom Grant played it one time. Um, uh, Lloyd Jones played it one time. The, all these guys who you really only know from their band context right. also wanted to come and do it. And then Tim was playing all of them as sort of the color guy. Yeah, the, the un unsung hero. It's funny. So you mentioned a bunch of those guys, and I think um, quite rightly, uh, you know, quite appropriately, um, when the Organ Music Hall of Fame uh, was sort of re-engaged, uh, uh, Terry Currier from Music Millennium um, was starting to recognize he put together an assembly of, of a, sort of a voting board, and you were one of the very first inductees. So the first year that they inducted members at the Organ Music Hall of Fame, you were right there at the top of it. And, yeah, uh, that's very flattering. I, and I couldn't be there because I was here. 
Yeah, that's a you had been there. So you said two thousand was when you moved. Is that right? Yeah, we moved in two thousand. It still okay. seems crazy that that's that long ago. Our plan was to give Nashville a five year try. <laughs> Uh, I think it took us almost 25 years to to flesh out that five years. Yeah. Did you move around a bunch when you got to Nashville? Did you like no. Just... We we lived in a rental house. Um, I was crazy, owned by a brilliant uh, session player here named K Catherine Marks. Um, and then we knew what part. I'd, I'd been here. You know, when I go to a new town, I... <sighs> I, I call it the lawnmower drive. I really like to know how a town is laid out. And so I've been doing this since I started teaching in Miami 12 years ago. I do it when I'm there. I go to a new town. I like to just drive up and down and see how the streets connect and how how can you get around during rush hour if you don't want to be on the highways. I, and, I, and so there's a few cities in America where I've done this a lot, San Francisco, Los Angeles, some in New York, certainly Atlanta, certainly here, certainly Miami. And when I was doing that, I really, I really liked this side of town, East Nashville. It was sort of, it's a little bit like the, uh, you know, the Brooklyn of, of New York. Um, it had been a, a predominantly a black part of town and a poor part of town. And so we, we could afford to buy a house over here. And the house that we bought in 2000 is the house we're still in. Really? Okay. Did they kind of gentrify that area a little bit since you've moved in? Yeah, tremendously, probably to our benefit for property values, but also to our detriment for property taxes. Yeah, of course. Well, there is, I mean, it, it just means that the value of the home is, is certainly that much, you know, like if uh, if you were to move, but it doesn't sound like you have any intention of, of bailing on Nashville, huh? No, actually, I think my time here is just about done. Really? I uh, does that something to do with your teaching, like University of Miami? Or are you feeling like no, no, I, I, I may, you know, the thing is in 2016, and this was, you know, we've been talking about Tim a little bit. And for those people who don't know, Tim passed in 2016 and it was just devastating to the community and to me and to everyone, even though I wasn't playing with him every week, like I had been when I lived there, we were, we were still playing every time I came to Portland, he was still playing on recordings. We we're still the best of friends. And, you know, what a what a stoic character, you know, he in December, he had a little bit of a cough and he went in and then by April he was gone. Yeah. Uh, and the, the bad timing of it for me was right at the exact time as he was in his decline, I was headed into spine surgery. And I could not travel to see him in his last days or to come to his service, which is was really horrible. Uh, you know, there's not, uh, everybody makes that list for themselves of the people that no matter what you would be there for the, in, under those circumstances. And I just couldn't, I couldn't, I, I couldn't even sit. I was just so miserable. And then the surgeon didn't want me traveling after the surgery. And so I'm, I missed those, those, those waning weeks. And I also missed his service. Um, but what that caused me to do was I couldn't tour either. So that was when I thought, okay, maybe I could, I've done a few song workshops. I've been, I've gone to a few song camps and been on the staff. Maybe I could see if anybody's interested in taking an online sign class for me. And I did some research and I, of course, have been great if I had invested in it, but I determined that Zoom was a superior platform to Skype for this purpose. Sure. And you could, and a, a Zoom account that you could have unlimited attendees and, and unlimited length was very cost effective. So in like I think in April, uh, still recovering from spine surgery, April of 2016, I started my first online song class. Um, and then it's just turned into a cottage industry. And then um, I, I was already teaching one class a week uh, via Skype at University of Miami. And that's sort of why I thought, well, maybe I could do this independently as well. And since then, I got hired full time at the University of Miami, but I still teach uh, via Zoom. Um, I hardly ever go there. And then I'm still, you know, I have another round of indie classes starting at, at the end of February. So that's turned into a, a whole other uh, profession in a weird way. And so with that being said, like you mentioned that your time in Nashville, it's kind of done. You have, are you, are you hiding? Uh, are you keeping secret where you want to go? Cause you don't want paparazzi finding out. Uh, it's not that it's not that it's that, I, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit before we got on 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 uh, on the actual broadcast. 
I'm an open book. You could just ask me anything. Yeah. But I'm married to someone who's a very private person. Oh, yeah. That's so that's while true. certain things I, I would just tell you, even though you would say it's not gossip because if it's something that's our life, it's still mine to tell, sometimes not mine to tell because okay. it's something that she might be closer to the vest about. So we haven't really made any announcements about that. It's not really a public topic, but I think we, I think we will be leaving Nashville uh, this year. Okay. I, I get it. I, you know, like I said, I mean, I, I saw you 30 years ago when I first moved to Portland in 94 uh, from Montana. Um, I had a lot of friends that I had moved out with that actually moved back. I may be one of two that are still here in the Portland area. Yeah. But I took a, a sabbatical for a year last year and went to Santa Fe. I was in love with the area and um, the the magic that I'd had, I'd felt in Portland kind of wasn't there anymore, you know? And the pandemic helped me see some of that. The, I didn't mind the rain. I kind of enjoyed it for a long no, time. No, it never bothered, never bothered me. The pandemic, though, it started to because I realized, oh, I've been touring so much that the seasonal effective thing doesn't get me because I'm always gone enough, that, right? It's so funny that you say that because it never bothered me while I lived in Portland. And then we moved here and I had to travel more. I, you know, you're in a car all day. Yeah. You're getting, even if you never get out of the car other than to get gas and food, you're getting more sunshine than when you're in the studio or you're in the house. Right. And I noticed that it had an effect on me. It's not that I felt like I was sad or depressed because I wasn't having more light, but I could feel the effect that it, the positive effect of having more light. Yeah. Yeah. Santa Fe was a surprise to me. Honestly, they had 320 days of sun a year, but I was at 8,000 elevation. I was up above the city and it was probably 10 degrees colder, you know, than wow. it was in Portland. And I didn't mind at all. It just was, uh, it was, it was magical, but that time came and I, I came back to Portland and, um, I'm trying to rediscover the, cause when I first moved here, um, it was a special time in Portland, you know, really all the, the bands that were, um, sort of becoming pop successes, you know, were really happening there and shortly after. And, um, and I met so many amazing musicians. Yeah. That was the thing. I, the pandemic shut a lot of that down. A lot of the venues that were happening no. then aren't here. Um, but I noticed that with a lot of cities, you know, so yeah. it's not just like a Portland thing. When people complain about certain areas, it's because they haven't gotten outside their circle, you know, yeah. and I, yeah. that's, I a, that's a whole topic, that idea of, you know, get out of your provincial, go see something else go learn. Yeah. I think it'd be really good for most Americans to get out of America to yeah. get some perspective. Oh man. How many people complain about politicians in America? when they don't look at other governments and how things are run that way or, or you know, problems that happen in their country. Yeah. And I think you, you're putting this on like the, you know, the, your community, but you know, every metropolitan city has an issue with economic disparity or yeah. homelessness or, you know, I mean, there are a lot of things that people complain about as if it's an American problem or a Portland problem when, you know, if you just travel a little bit, you'll see that, you know, every place has its own challenges or benefits. And so now you, you may already know this because you're a student of the music scene, but there's kind of before your time, there was a huge development where previous to like the late 60s, it might have been as early, it might have been as late as 70 or 71, but I think it was 68 or 69 live music could not be performed in any place that had a liquor license. Right. That's right. And so when that law got changed, there was this explosion. And that was, you know, Johnny and the Distractions came up during that time. And Seafood Mama that became Quarter Flesh came up during that time. And um, so many, you know, uh, Lloyd Jones came through in a band, a band called Brown Sugar. And there were this incredibly vibrant scene, you know, Kular, and uh, there had already been, um, I don't know if you ever heard of them, it was Nate Phillips, and and uh, there was a band out of Northeast Portland called Pleasure in the oh, 60s yeah. that was big all over the country and virtually unknown in Portland. And so many heavy cats came out of that. Dennis Springer was in that band. Bruce Carter was in that band. Um, Nate Phillips was in that band. It was really uh, Dennis Springer an incredible list of, of really heavy cats. And then that gave rise to this sort of, there was this, there was a period of time when um, there was a club called 
if all, everyone wants to say rodeo, but that's not what they were calling it. They were calling it rodeo. Mm -hmm. And there was music at Chuck's, which became uh, something else. And then there was music at Frankenstein's, which became something else. And music at what was called then Naughty Jane's, which became Aldo's, which became Domini's, and all these things, and Patty's. And there was, you could walk around and hear just killer music that was only a block or two apart down in that particular part, down that sort of Yamhill Market area of, yeah. of Portland. And the Dandelion Pub and the Orange Peel and clubs like that for, for rock bands. And, you know, sequel was happening. And yeah. I mean, it was just epic how many cool bands there were. Yeah. And, you know, I used to joke, my, 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 we talked a little bit about my bio, but my old bio used to say, that I made, I made a living for 20 years in a 40 block radius. Yeah. I, I didn't have to go anywhere. I, I would, I would, I could play just like near my house practically and then go home and be home and, and not be on the road hardly ever. And that was a mixed blessing because it made it really easy to survive as a musician in Portland, but it didn't put a fire in my belly to try to get someplace and get more attention because it was, you know, it was easy. Sure. And then I, you know, I just wanted to write songs. And at that time, I just wanted to write songs and chase girls. And yeah. it was, and I could have a cheap apartment and do both. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, that's what kind of lights the fire into most, most uh, young male musicians. Right. But uh, yeah, when you, uh, when you went to Nashville, you mentioned that you had gone a bunch of times, like over the years, you'd go once or twice. And, um, you know, the Bluebird, of course, is known internationally for this songwriter in the round. You know, this is a place where, the biggest songwriters in the world will congregate there and, and play these shows. And it's almost impossible to get in there most times if you're just a, a it is, song. but but that's really the fault of the Nashville TV show. Okay. Because the Bluebird was like the church of acoustic music. And if you had a really good turn of phrase in a song, you would kind of get golf applause or like jazz club applause for a solo in the middle of a song. Really? People were just on board. And so it was this incredible place to play because people were really people. No one's paying more attention at a Jackson Brown show or a James Taylor show or in the modern day, a John Mayer show or a Josh Ritter show. They're not paying more attention there than they do than they used to at the Bluebird. And then the Nashville TV show came along and it turned it into a tourist destination. Mm, yeah. And so now it's on everybody's bucket list that they have to go to the Bluebird. Like you know, when I was in Paris and I went to the Louvre, People are taking their picture in front of the Mona Lisa instead of looking at it. Oh, yeah. That, that and that is... happened to the Bluebird. And so now when you say, you know, how many people have never been here before? 80, 90% of the audience raises their hand. Wow. And they're the lucky ones who get tickets because about 2,000 people uh, try to get in for those 90 seats. And, and the first 400 go into some electronic revolving drum. And even if you're the first one in the 400, that doesn't necessarily mean you get a seat. So it's really hard to get in. And that has pretty much shut out the locals and the hardcore song lovers. So mostly you're playing there to tourists. That's, a, I mean, like I said, I grew up in Montana, right? I used to work in Yellowstone. And I'd most, a lot of my gigs, I'd play ski resorts and we play just on the outer parts, parts of the park. And now I, you know, I grew up in Bozeman then it's where the TV show Yellowstone is based and it yeah. was already sort of a caricature of what it had been. But um, when people find out where I'm from, they say, Oh yeah, I love Costner. You know, I love what, and I think I can't watch the show, you know, cause it, it to me, it, it just, it's soulless and it doesn't have. But, but the irony of the show is about the idea that he wants to preserve Montana. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. That, yeah, and well, the show itself is contrary to that purpose. Yeah, now, well, I do that, have to say, Bluebird is still a great place to play and a really fun place to play. And it's a, and largely, just because people are tourists doesn't mean they're, they're not into it. But it's it's different. You have to, it's like any other gig where you have to win them over. They're not already dying to hear the clever mechanics of a song. They're, they want to hear hit songs, which I can't really play any for them because I don't have any. And they and they want to hear familiar songs, but many audiences are still wonderful audiences. But you have to you have to go after them a little bit, like you would in any other nightclub, as opposed to them just being already completely queued up mm -hmm. to every little nuance, like it used to be. But the thing you were talking about when you saw Tim and, and I play is that part of that's what makes the Bluebird show so fun is that 
if I play there with Annie Mosier and Tony Arata and Dave Berg, I feel like I have the best seat for that show of them. Mm. And then Dave feels like he has that seat for, and then Tony, and it's our mutual admiration thing. That's what makes the show so interesting, really, I think to anyone, but that's what makes it so fun for us is that we're really playing for each other. It, you know, you mentioned that the TV show brought in that tourist culture. I see this in so many shows, you know, you, and you mentioned too, somebody at the Louvre taking a picture of the Mona Lisa with themselves out in front instead of really focusing. I picture 90 people, if 80% of them are tourists, I picture this is what you're looking at all the time. I'm picturing them live streaming your show. Or... Yeah, except it's forbidden. Okay, so no live streaming. Then no the, other, the other side of it is they're used to being at home. So do you get the chatter? You get the people that are just talking at their table yeah, over the top. That's, that's also the, the, the overwhelming country. You know, there are signs at the Bluebird that say, shh. Nice. And although it's not as voluntarily quiet as it used to be, you, you still have, I, there's still, a, it still is a great place to play because it still is a complete listening room. Yeah. And nobody's talking loud. And the loudest conversation you might hear is a waitress quietly asking somebody what them want, what they want, and them answering quietly. People do take pictures, and sometimes uh, family members or or whatever uh, paramours of people who are playing, you know, discreetly do a phone video from their from their table. But it really is a very respectful place still. Right. Um, yeah. And, and it's the luck of the draw. Sometimes it's a bunch of people who thought they should be there and they sort of act bored. Mm. And sometimes it's a bunch of people who feel so lucky to have gotten in and they're as good of audience as you could have anywhere. That's, uh, Richard Marks, had, there was a viral clip that went out a couple of weeks ago of Richard Marks. And I know he's a Nashville guy, right? I think you've probably seen him around a bunch of times. And I've never laid once eyes on him. I've been here all this time, never seen him once. Wow. Well, he, like you, is, you know, like uh, a lot of people don't realize how many songs he's written for other people. You know, he's got a oh, million yeah. hits out there. It's crazy to look at his discography and, and the songwriting. Uh, we played a bunch of shows with him and um, he's great in that songwriters in the round kind of vibe because he's very comedic. He, you know, he's, he, he's somewhat self-deprecating and also uh a little you know uh, well, a little cocky and, little, and, little cocky and he has but, the goods he can actually play and sing and he's a real and he's a real songwriter for sure the clip that was going around a couple of weeks ago was uh he was doing a duet thing acoustic with rick springfield and they were doing a little tour uh rick and rich or something um and somebody in the audience uh, had too much to drink and she's screaming out the song she wants to hear endlessly just over and over and he pulls out his earbud and he's i mean b rates are pretty hard he's like who raised you this way you know and uh and i i i get super frustrated for other songwriters when i see that happen you know and i understand and because he got kind of ro he got roasted for being pretty you know brutal with this woman but i thought she paid money to get into the show you know and obviously i mean we've all seen people that have had too much to drink and they kind of ruin the night for everybody else but have you had any experiences like that where you've had to actually just shut it down and, and put somebody in their place? Well, countless, but never at the Bluebird. All right. I the, the, I had an exchange with somebody who was in the round with me once that became quite, I won't tell you who it was, but I'll tell you the story. This, this person who's a talented singer songwriter, he said to the bartender, I'd like to have a martini, but could I have a pearl onion in it instead of an olive? And I said, in complete innocent good nature, I said, you know, they call that a Gibson. If it's got a pearl onion, it's not called a martini. And he said, got, and he looked like, got that really frustrated defensive look in his face like I had corrected him. And he said, Crothers, you could probably pick a fight with a fence post. And I said, and I said, I believe I just have. Yeah. And, and so then, so then for the rest of the night, he was taking these sort of not very effective jabs at me. And I just, I just couldn't help it. You know, it's like, Shh. but I have certainly been, you know, a lot of that comes down to the venue. We used to play in a place. I used to do a lot of rounds with Gene Nelson, who's a hit songwriter and Don Henry, who I mentioned earlier. We used to do a lot of uh, songwriter rounds at a place called the Swallow of the Hollow, which was a great barbecue place in Roswell, just outside of Atlanta. 
And the guy who ran the place would come up at the beginning of the night and it was a raucous bar room and, and people having dinner and drinking and laughing. And he'd say, can I have your attention, please? And people would quiet down. He says, we're about to start a listen, please show modeled after the bluebird. And if you're not here to listen to music, I, I, I'm, I, I understand, but I want you to wrap it up and be on your way. And or if you want to talk or smoke, we have a lovely porch outside. The weather's lovely. You're welcome to be out there. But if you're in here, we expect you to be respectful of the performers. We brought them all the way down from Nashville. And this is a it's a show. It's a concert. Nice. And man, they would just land people out of there who would not go with that. But you know what? When you tell an audience what's expected of them, almost always they can they will do that. Sure. You know, um, the, the hard part is when the management is not going to participate at all and you have somebody who's really a problem and then it becomes this adversarial thing between you and this one other person right. whereas you know like I, you see some of those comedy shows where somebody's being a real jerk and then they're escorted out the comedian doesn't have to do it right yeah but then that you know speaking of being roasted louis ck got in a lot of trouble one time when he started a show and somebody's given him grief and he just said okay i'm done just left right. yeah but you know that's a that's an old tradition. Mose Allison used to have a strict policy about you, you could not smoke long before there were ever no smoking rooms. You cannot smoke in my show. It's, I can't tolerate it. And they and they made that completely clear. And I saw him in Seattle. I got to open a few shows for him, but before that, I saw him in Seattle, and they were so great. And they got two songs in, and somebody in the bar lit up a cigarette. And he finished the song. And he said good night. And they and he just left and that was it and it's in his writer yeah. that the club has to control that and they hadn't and he was done i i you know what's what's wrong with it you knew what to expect yeah. this is a listening room if you don't like it do something else sure yeah well people have gotten so used to being in their homes especially during the pandemic right they watch tv and their whole life sort of revolves around netflix and talking to the tv and you know if you go to a theater I, I, I hadn't been to a movie theater in a long time. And uh, the last, I mean, I went to Oppenheimer, right? In, an amazing cinematic movie. The the sound design in that movie really is what made it for me. And it was so um, sparse in dialogue for a lot of it. But that opened it up for people in the theater to talk. And it drives me crazy, you know, thinking... I, you know what? It's a, it's a financial investment. It's a time investment, a three hour investment of my time that I could have done something else, but I came to the theater. What makes you audience person feel like your time is more valuable than mine or anybody and, else's. Right. And you know, when I was younger and probably more foolish, I, you know, that, that, that notion of choose your battles, that was not in my vocabulary. <laughs> I, I would just say, Hey, shut up in the theater. And then somebody would say, why don't you make me? And I go, well, why don't I call 911 first so they can carry you out? And, you know, I just was always like, act like I was a tough guy, even though I wasn't. Uh, and, you know, that <laughs> didn't go well a couple of times. But I think people, you know, when I was a kid, if you're messing around in somebody's lawn and they came out and said, hey, get off our property, you felt like you were in trouble. Right. Now, I think people are afraid that if they say anything to, to anybody who's behaving badly, there's going to be repercussions. And what that causes, in my opinion, is people being too afraid to step in when they ought to step in. Sure. Yeah. Well, as an educator, you probably see just accountability, like changes in accountability. As a kid, you've been doing this long enough, too. Um, I would imagine that uh, your, your perspective on, on students and I, I know that a lot of it too is their age and, and maybe how they were raised right but but uh but i'm sure you've seen a lot of um differences between virtual teaching and students in in class too right so in person where um, people might have the sort of anonymity behind being behind a camera and not as accountable as actually being right there face to face you're you're absolutely right about that but i haven't done all of my teaching virtually I mean, I've been there a couple of times, but the ratios, I've hardly done any in person. But the funny thing is, I, I'm not an academic. I come from having been a professional musician my whole life. You know, if you don't show up where you're supposed to be, you get kicked out of the band, you lose the gig, you lose the audition. 
You don't get the interview, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because they're so competitive that knucklehead behavior is not tolerated very much in any serious context in the music business. Kids at college are used to having their parents be permissive and they're used to having the school be kind of spongy about holding them accountable. And so I often say sort of jokingly, how is it possible that Bohemian me is the most strict disciplinarian at the entire school? But I am. Just this weekend, I told them, I said, you know, on time is an illusion. You have to be early to be on time. And at any time after on time is late. And so class starts at this time. If we were on campus, I would lock the door then. And if you weren't in the class, you missed that class. I'm Here's how I'm doing it in the class. I'm taking a screenshot at the moment class starts. And if you're not in it, that's you're late and three late arrivals is an unexcused absence and three unexcused absences is an F. Mm. So this weekend I have to send some screenshots to some, uh, to some uh, people I like very much, talented young people who think that showing up one or two or three or four minutes late is cool because every place else in the school, it is tolerated, mm. right. but that we're not helping them be more professional. If we don't hold them to professional standards. Sure. I say every year, I say, if there's, if it's, if you're lucky, you're going to learn something about songwriting from me. But I think that most of what I hope you learn from me is about professionalism and treating other people with respect. Yeah. Wow. So many conversations I've had on this show were about uh, how to get the gig, how to keep the gig, what keeps projects together. Uh, because, uh, you know, I've had certainly drummer buddies ask me about certain gigs that I've had. And I'm like, and they, they openly say, it's not like you're the best drummer. I'm like, yeah, no, you're right. It's because I'm reliable. I show up. I'm easy to work with, right? The hang is so key. There you and go. The, um, the professionalism and, and really being punctual in your space right there in Nashville, like I said, early on in the show, people that I've known that went to Nashville kind of expecting to maybe throw some songs around and have them get picked up, uh, land a great gig came back sorely mistaken because it, nothing is handed out there, right? There's no, so much competition. Here's the thing. Let's say that you're whoever you are, you're the most, it's, it's a little bit like being the best quarterback in your little town in Bakersfield. And you're, and you're just the star of, of the high school. And then you get drafted by USC and you meet a bunch of other cats that make you go, Oh man, I didn't even, I had no idea where I was in the overall scheme of things. Sure. Well, that crushes some people and it makes some people work harder. Yeah. Right. And so when you come to Nashville, you already believe in yourself as a drummer or a guitar player, a bass player, or a songwriter, but let's say, especially for players. But the thing is there are 50 guitar players as good as you. So get in that line. Are you late? You're out. Are, is the hang prickly are you kind of a pain in the ass to be around you're out are you struggling with your equipment you're out do you need to show off you're out yeah so you what you end up with is people who are really easy to work with who are really good and all they want to do is serve the song mm. not showboat yeah. and they're on time and their gears together and they're a joy to work with and that's why they work yeah Amen. and for example, I know a cat who used to tour with a really well-known band and a phenomenal guitar player. He couldn't stop trying to show off in sessions, so he ended up painting houses. Mm -hmm. And and for songwriters, this was tough for me when I first came here because I had my illusions about what country songs were, or what because I'm not a I'm not really a student of the, I wasn't then a student of the genre. And so what would happen to me is people in Portland who wrote really cool songs, but not songs, that, the kind of songs they're looking for here. And they would say, well, now, you know, that, you know, this person at Sony, won't you play my song for them? And I'll say, I love your song. Let's not be wrong about that. But if I take this song to this person at Sony, they'll think I won't know the difference. Mm. I will lose my credibility because, you know, if I, if they're looking for a bass player and I recommend Bootsy Collins, okay, I don't know what they're looking for because that's not what they're looking for. Sure. 
And so I would have people from the Northwest say, oh, you're just trying to hog all the opportunity for yourself. And I go, I'm really not. Man, if, if you had something that I thought, I would absolutely take it to anybody who would listen because I want good songs to prevail. But that's not, there's a lot of political things. Now the big thing is almost all the songs that are on the charts are co-written with the artists. Right. And so there's a tremendous hierarchy of who even gets to do that. Sure. And a lot of those artists are not really writers. They are in a position where it's mutually advantageous. You know, you and I get together to write a song and you're a veteran songwriter and I'm a new, I'm a beautiful young ingenue who has a record deal. It helps me to have your good song on my record. It helps you to have your song on my record. Yeah. Well, you, you bring up the two things. I mean, first, the first song I heard about you landing, landing, um, Trish Yearwood, the, the theme yeah. song from Con Air, right? So that was the first biggie that I remember, I think, Tim bragging on you saying, hey, Craig's out there making things work, right? Oh, so, well, actually, the song she recorded was Little Hercules. Trish did that one. Yeah, the, that that How Do I Live, or whatever that song was that she and uh, Leon, I didn't write that, that she okay. and Leanne Rimes both recorded. Uh, that was the Con Air song. No, I didn't have anything to do with that. No, she recorded Little Hercules. Wow. I like the song that, like I said, that was a, the first, the one that grabbed me. Uh, I'm glad that Terry Finley here in the chat has brought this one up too. Like Airmail Blue, that album and the track from that. I'm, Terry, thank you, by the way, for being here. Terry, you probably remember Terry well, right? From the Portland. Hi, Terry. I love him. Uh, he mentioned that you had the band Nerve that used to open for the Dan Reed Network. And, uh, <laughs> like the, like the, we were just doing everything to get in front of audiences. You know, we had our own gigs, but the opening act slot was a good one, especially on the few times when we had labels come into town. Yeah. Did you get signed with that band? No. Um, it was weird. I got signed at that time. We got signed to Atlantic. Okay. Um, and there was a shakeup in the band right before it happened. And at the time that we actually got signed, the only person who I was still working with was, was Greg and, uh, and Tim. Okay. And I, and I brought, you know, I hired people from, you know, Phil Baker had played some with us and I, and I hired him to play on it. And, um, Dan Brandt, who had been in go 90 and my other band, orange orange was living in Belgium at the time. And I, I always felt like, you know, it was really seminal in my early days and I wanted him to come back and play on it. And, um, you know, so that was really fun. We made that record out of sound impressions, but, uh, my a and R guy got fired before my record was released and they shelved all his records. Yeah. That story. It's like the, it's like the same yeah. story over and over. Well, going back to like, say, um, working with Trish Yearwood and Leanne Rhymes, when you got a song like that, um, you don't just show up in Nashville throw your songs up on you know on a you know a, in sheet music on a on a table somewhere and have these people pick them up there's got to be a process that i'm sure it's different now than it was 25 years ago when you went to nashville but tell me about how you sort of introduced those songs and and how they discovered you how those partnerships happen well there's a there's a really sort of a sarcastic thing that you may, you've probably heard some version like this that your friends will say to you when you have some success and then they'll go, hey, that's great, man. It's all downhill from here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, oh, thanks a lot. Like, that's lucky that that even happened to you. But in a way, that's exactly what happened to me. I had uh, Bunzo, John Bunzo had had a record deal here and he knew a few people. And Dave Berg, who I also knew a little bit, was signed to a company called Crossfire. And so I did as much networking as I could to try to get some appointments with a few people. And, you know, mostly they were, they would listen to my stuff and go, yeah, why don't you go to LA? You, you know, this is not country. And I go, well, I know, but, but there's stuff getting recorded by Patty Loveless and Trisha Yearwood, sort of, sort of the fringes of, you know, where the Eagles and Poco and those kind of bands that used to be kind of the, the ultra right of pop music became kind of the ultra left of country music. And so I thought there's, you know, I'd heard a few songs. I heard a song called, has anybody seen Amy by a, uh, written by Don Henry, who I eventually met and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, you know, the here I am written, that was Patty Lovis written by Tony Rodda. I heard some amazing songs. And I thought, you know, may, maybe there is. So Scott Parker and Carol Parker, who used to be the Carol Mack band in Portland, 
had moved here. And that's really the first time. I, it wasn't like I thought about Nashville and ruled it out. I never entertained the idea of coming here. Really? And then one day he reached out to me like in, I think in maybe late 94, or early 95. And he's, and I'll tell you, I can remember it exactly. He said, Hey man, I just wanted you to know. And we didn't know each other that well because in the time when they were here, we were always playing at the same time, you know, you know, your other peers in the, in the community, but you don't hang with them because you're working when they're working. Right. And so Scott said, you know, when we get really homesick for Portland, we buy a Willamette Valley Pino and we put on your record home remedy and we have some people over and we talk about you and we talk about Portland. And I thought, well, that's such a sweet thing for you to call and tell me. And he said, but this last time we did it, we got to thinking that maybe something could happen for you here. You know, you're such a good songwriter and maybe there's a room for your kind of songs here. And why don't you come out and stay with us and, you know, I'll introduce you to anybody I can introduce you to. Well, none of those introductions really panned out, um, but I, I had an excuse to come. Um, but the person that was the, the, a woman named Betty Rosen, who was at Dave Berg's company, I had an appointment with her. And it was really as a favor to him, you know, like if somebody, you know, she, I, I went to her, she goes, okay, I got five minutes to play me one song. And so it was like that really, you know, I'm doing this because this person I'm affiliated with asked me to, but I, I don't really have time for it. And so I said, okay, well, this was supposed to be my single when I got signed to Atlantic, but I got dropped. It's a song called Little Hercules. And I, so I said, it's the first song on, on this CD. And she turned her back on me in her, in her chair. And I thought, okay, well, this is going well. Yeah. And, then, and then she did that thing that really only women can do where they pull, they draw their knees up into the chair and put their arms around them. Guys don't really sit that way that much, but sometimes right. women do. Yeah. And I saw her doing that sort of from the angle. And then I kind of heard this sound and I went that simultaneous of, oh, I don't want to upset her. And uh, is the song getting to her? Like that sort of yeah. <laughs> contrary emotions. Wow. And she turned around and she said, well, if it's any consolation, I think Atlantic made a big mistake. Awesome. I think I know who I want to play this for. And I want to bring my boss, Ken Levitan, to, to your two song set at the Bluebird that you told me you have Sunday. And then they did. And then they invited me in uh, and offered me a two song deal, one for that song and one for another song. And then during the time that that deal was being negotiated, um, she said, you really need to get this signed because it's already been recorded by Trisha Yearwood. Oh my God. And so then I got to meet Garth Fundus who produced her record when I came back to town and so that was my, that was, that's the thing that, that was my first trip. And by my second trip, this had happened and I had a two song deal. And, and then that led to a full on publishing deal. And then I was taking four or five trips a year to write and record and co-write here while I was still living and playing five nights a week in Portland. Did you have some, somebody sort of representing you back there saying, all right, Craig, the next time you come out, I've got you sitting down with so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so, like these yeah yeah just and, and some of that was good co-writing was never my favorite i've got some songs that i love so much that are co-writes but it never was my most comfortable way to work and for me it's a little bit like there's really no co-paintings and very few co-novels right. and very few movies that are co-directed there's something about when you are in charge of where it's going to go, you make your own quirky decisions, you build your own weird foundation, and the crooked house you built on top of it is how you want it to look. Yeah. And, and, and art by committee is more careful and, right. and almost by definition, less quirky. Yeah. And that's you know, never the music that I like the best, usually. I can certainly see like, you know, like Chihuly, you know, sculptures, right? And Dale Chihuly like started off the like glass sculptures and it was an interesting and unique thing until he sort of franchised and had all of his students doing a sort of replica work. Yeah. And now you see Chihuly, Chihuly everywhere and there's nothing special about it. I can see no. that. But the funny but, thing is like, it's, it's like in a co-write, you're trying to come to a consensus. Hmm. And if, if, if you do something that the other person doesn't like, then you immediately want to change it because you're seeking this biofeedback of mutual approval. But when you're doing it yourself, you have some unusual idea that you like and you're not questioning it. And then you build on that. And it becomes, it's, it, 
Joni Mitchell songs are not co-written. Right. And I don't know if you know who Josh Ritter is, but he's yes. such a great young songwriter. Those he writes those songs by himself. The I I I think almost there's an incredible song by a guy named Mark Kozlik that was covered by Phoebe Bridgers called "You Missed My Heart." No one would ever write that song in a co-write. It's if you don't know that song, I, I love his version, but her version is really disarming, okay. and it's just an extraordinary song. But I don't think anybody would write a song like that in a collaboration. I just don't think I don't think you'd get to that that unusual narrative that and whatever the mission of that song is. And I think that songs do have missions. Even the songwriters don't think about them that way. They, they you haven't intended. You're trying to reach. You're not just trying to express yourself. You're trying to elicit a particular kind of uh, response emotionally or. Uh, an epiphany intellectually. I think filmmakers are doing this. Everybody, every artist of every ilk is not just expressing themselves. They're trying to get you to have a particular experience. And in that way, we're all manipulators, even though that word has a has a bad sure. rap. Yeah, well, that one in particular obviously made you feel something, that, that song. What's the last song you can think of that made you cry? Last song that made me cry? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, it wasn't very long ago. Um, I, I, there are songs that have that effect on me that I, that when I go back to them, even, you know, yeah. the, 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 this, I, I'm not sure crying is, is the, although that does happen to me, certain songs have that effect on me. I think the song that's had the most profound effect on me in recent memory is this song I'm talking about. You Missed My Heart, which is written by a guy named Mark Kozlik. But the version, Phoebe Bridgers, version, she's so brave to do this song because it's not, there's nothing remotely commercial about it. Mm. Um, you know, there's a song, there's a beautiful song from 1929 called Among My Souvenirs. And I think that might be the last song that made me well up. It's, it, it does, you know, there's a thing in Shakespeare where he talks about showing beauty her own, its its own aspect, as though beauty were like one of the Greek goddesses or something. And then this uh, this is also something that happens in a, a song that was recorded by Trisha Yearwood that was written by Vince Melmed and Greg Barnhill, where they say, uh, the truth revealed what it had known. And this idea of personifying giving an agenda to the wind or fate or something. It's such a cool idea. As far as I know, it stems from Shakespeare. But in this song from 1929, he talks about, you know, among my souvenirs, I've got this and that and the other. And though they do their best to bring me consolation, as though that's their agenda, his his souvenirs are trying to cheer him up. And it just kills me. It's so, yeah. it's so beautiful. And it's so timeless. Uh, you know, there's a lot of songs that we think of as being modern songs. Do you know when Try a Little Tenderness was written? When? 1932. Are you kidding me? Most people think of the Otis Redding version in 66 as the beginning. Yeah. But that song has been a hit for multiple artists in every decade for 90 plus years. Wow. Unbelievable. Crazy. Wow. So why? So why? So why? So why? So part of my gig is analyzing that stuff and trying to talk about what it is that we can learn from the greats who came before us. I will admit uh, something. I'm not proud of this at all, but for the longest time, lyrics were the last thing I heard in a song. Oh, you're not alone at all. Really? Well, I, I you know, it's not just because I'm a drummer, but the stuff that moved me were melodies, chord sure. progressions, you know, and those were the things that would make me tear up. Just a progression that just happened to, to, you know, in the classical music would certainly do that, right? There are certain. Oh, well, that's classical an easier music. answer. The last music that made me cry was Chopin, and, a, okay. and that was just earlier this week. Um, but the funny thing about it is, as great as lyrics can be, the music always wins. Yeah. The music is. It's like the there's the dialogue and the shots in the movie, but the soundtrack is telling you how to feel about it. Yeah. And. Uh, one, one of the exercises that I give my students is I make them string together as many tired cliches as possible for the lyric and then try to write the most beautiful melody and harmony they can think of. Oh my God, that's great. The music always wins. Yeah. Yeah. It's so beautiful that 
some songs are so beautiful musically that when you take them away and you just look at the lyrics, it's not even very good. But the music wins because it's so powerful. You know, there was certainly an era. I mean, we talked a little bit about, I mentioned the Sunset Strip era, you know, like that vapid part of the 80s rock era where lyrically, you know, things were so cheesy and contrived and, and superficial. Country had an era there too. I mean, there's certain, and, they, and it was dogged for a lot of just ridiculous lyrics, right? There was nothing profound in the, the, the actual lyrical content. Musically, though, the hook is always there, right? I and mean, that's the big thing that just seemed to get, and it seems to be what helped things cross over, you know, where, where country and, and rock sort of blended and became, you know, a lot more commercially accessible to everybody, right? Because they, um, you know, they sort of added elements. I mean, like when I think of country artists that are really not traditional country artists, Garth Brooks is a rock star, right? The guy that he's basically, you know, like kiss with a cowboy hat kind of, you know, um, and that that's actually dumbing down his lyrics. I think his lyrics are a lot more, I think, intelligent, you know, than. But of than, course, he's not the writer of those songs. OK, so, yeah, you mentioned the dance earlier. So he's actually had oh, a writer. My, God. my yeah. friend Tony Arata wrote the dance. OK. And if you can believe it, that's not even one of his best songs. He's wow. such a good songwriter. Without a doubt, that's his most successful song. Sure. Crazy successful and profound. And to hear him play it is really deeply moving. But he's a brilliant songwriter who it's a little bit like uh, drummers should listen to him play the guitar so they can understand the groove because he rocks so hard. Wow. And he sings kind of like, he sounds kind of like Ray Charles. And, really? and and he's a white guy from Savannah, Georgia. And man, he's the most soulful cat. And just, it's just nice as the day is long. Just, just a sweetheart. If you were to, Kevin, if you were to meet him, if you were to come someplace with me and meet Tony, would, the whole room would blur out behind you. And he'd look you in the eye and talk to you like you're the only, like you were the person he wanted something from. Kevin, so nice to meet you. How long have you been in Nashville? Uh, I, where are you from? What, tell me about yourself. You would feel like the most important person in the room. And he, if anybody has license to have attitude, it would be him because he's been phenomenally successful and he's just a genius. And he's the nicest guy on the planet crazy a, yeah then that's a gift right we 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 all aspire to have people like that in our lives and it's nice to hear about that in nashville i'm glad he's in your camp it, it's yeah. a gift to have him in my life for sure yeah. but i think that's a direct response of parenting yeah right i think if your parents let you get away with being an asshole then you just feel like you have yeah. hard blanche are you a, are you a dad no because you've seen other people enable their kids to become assholes. Since, well, know. I, I've been, the thing is you can't, you meet people like, for, like for Tony, I've never met his parents, but I can tell yeah. just by the way he acts and, you know, he, he grew up knowing what was important to, to be a decent human being. Yeah, and I think when sense. you meet people who don't act that way, you know, you when you're a kid and your and your parents say to you, you don't want to do that because that'll look reflect badly on us. And you think to yourself, no, people are just evaluating me on me. It doesn't have anything to do with you. Oh, contraire, you That's know. Awesome. And then, of course, twelve years teaching at a university, I see a lot of it on both directions. People who the, who are just so entitled and just are just convinced that their talent is is. is the only thing that matters and they don't have to be fair or conscientious people. And then some people who are just so, so together already at 20, so responsible, so look you in the eye, so apologize if they're late, so not be late, you know, it's just really impressive. And I think maybe not every time, but almost always that really speaks to what, what, what did you learn growing up? Mm, yeah. You know, um, certainly I've seen, people who I thought were raising their kids to be wild Indians, as that expression used to go, who turned into perfectly great young adults. And it's, it's always a little bit of a head scratcher. Uh, but I think what they did grow up with, if they didn't grow up with a lot of boundaries, they grew up with a lot of love. Yeah. And I think that if you know your parents have your back and that they're really rooting for you and, you're, and you don't have a violent or absent parent, 
I think you, I think that shapes you. And of course there's exceptions. People who grew up in good families who turn into jerks and, and people who had nothing who have become wonderful people. I know, but I think a lot of you act as a director has a lot to speaks to a lot of, of, of your upbringing. I, I, I will not disagree with that. Uh, I've heard from several friends that have been in Nashville and uh, maybe you'd have the same perspective about somebody that they say has those kind of qualities, those uh, respectful qualities and hardworking and uh, gave accolades to her songwriting. She's huge, biggest name in the, in the industry right now. Uh, Taylor Swift showing up in Nashville, right? You know, it's, it's almost, you can sort of decide you're not going to like her because she's so popular. And, and I, and I, I there was, and of course, and before that, you know, she was writing songs with uh, uh, Liz Rose, who is a genius songwriter. And so those early songs, I attributed all of those. I thought, okay, this is Liz Rose. This is the conventional Nashville story. But man, you get to writing a song like Antihero. What a great song. I, I, I can't, I can't hold, you know, her, her success, you know, the fact that she's a little bit of a fairy princess white girl, of course, that's part of why she gets to be the biggest thing on earth. Yeah, and it's yeah. weird how much it's influenced all talk about the Super Bowl. That's just crazy. Yeah, but it's impossible. She's got a really, she really plays and sings. She's really a good player and really a good singer and really a good songwriter and a very industrious and fair, conscientious person. And from all accounts, uh, you know, everybody who, well, you know, the same with Dolly Parton, everybody who has any encounter with her just says that, you know, for that moment, they're the center of the universe and she just yeah. zeroes in on them. Um, I had that experience with Trisha Yearwood. I got to sing a little Hercules with her at a couple of shows and she's just, uh, just a great person. Oh, that, but not everybody, just, not everybody's a great person. Of course not. <laughs> but you know what? I mean, the, because there are a few people like that, there there are a handful in the world that just give you hope, right? You know, when I heard those things about Taylor, yeah, just because she's, you know, this fairy princess, you know, young white gal who's pretty and you would think, okay, yeah, she's got it easier than some. Well, sure, the luck of the dice roll allowed her to, you know, to show up and, and be pretty. and and But the fact that she put in the work and you mentioned conscientious and, and decent you know, decency is a big thing. When the reports came out about her going way above and beyond taking care of not only her band, but her crew and every truck driver. Oh yeah. my God, man. Yeah. It yeah. just like, I thank you, Taylor Swift's mom and dad. If that, <laughs> you really, you know, like she's definitely surrounded herself with people obviously in her life that have influenced her in a really good way. Because in a young artist, you hear way too many young artists that show up and have success and the entitlement and the, you know, they just, they go off the deep end, just really screwing things up well, for I, their legacy. I, I think the key word here is artist, which is a word that in Nashville means a person who has a record deal. I am not an artist by the Nashville measure, but I have a different definition of it. I think if you're a young, pretty person who has a record deal and you're singing somebody else's songs, you're a singer. Mm. You're not an artist because you're not, it's not your perspective on the world that you're sharing. Sure. So even really young Taylor was writing songs. Yeah. Maybe they're, they're not as good as they were, but she was an avid, she was a pretty good singer and guitar player when she first came to town, when she was really young. And she, she was on a mission to get better. Um, and I didn't know her during those days. I don't know her now, but I didn't know anything about her in those days. Some of that stuff I've learned later, later on, but you know, I think it's different to be, you know, Van Gogh dies penniless with never having sold a painting. Would we, would we have him have done something different so he could have been comfortable I, 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 in our, in our selfishness? No, because maybe other than the Mona Lisa, no visual art has touched more human beings on earth. There's nobody. And the thing is, when you look at his painting, it doesn't look like a painting of a field of sunflowers. It looks like how a field of sunflowers makes you feel. Yeah. And that's just a magic power. Joni Mitchell is pouring out her heart. James Taylor is pouring out his heart. Even if it doesn't seem emotional, 
The Steely Dan guys are saying what they had to say. The Beatles are saying what they had to say. The Kinks are saying what they had to say, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think no matter how talented you are as a performer, singer, player, if you're not doing, if it's not your perspective, you wouldn't call a painter, you know, and, and maybe it's maybe it's mean. We don't generally call graphic artists, we don't think of them in the same way that, they, that we think of painters. Right. We think of them as craftspeople. So some brilliant singers are not really great songwriters. Sure. And, and so Nashville has allowed, well, it's just sort of grown up in the last 25 years that they, now they're not just the song delivery people and they used to be really disposable because of that. Um, somebody young and pretty from Macon, Georgia would get a record deal and then she would go out and do all the radio shows and all the touring to deliver songs she didn't own and that she didn't write to the marketplace. And in every interview, it would be, well, you know, my music, blah, blah, blah. Well, the music that you recorded that you're playing, but it didn't really come from you. And then when they get burnt out because there's no revenue there, if you're not an, an owner in that, it's ultimately, it's like a, it's like one big cover gig. Right. Um, it burns them out and then they quit. But the people who are, you know, is, is Randy Newman quitting, even though he's in antiquity, he's a little bit older than I am. Uh, he, it, it's it is he is his own Van Gogh, Joni Mitchell, you know, and there's so many people like that. And I think that people who are just uh, recording artists who are not writers probably take offense at this characterization. But there's an expression in Nashville about the different kind of writers. There's the writer artist where the song has to be right. And I will I'll do my best to deliver it when I am the performer of it. But the song is everything. And then there's the artist writer who believes that their artistry is everything and the song can just be okay because, and, and I don't even know this is a conscious thought process, but my, how cool I am, how beautiful I am, how great my voice is, how cool my band is, that's the product. And the song can just be along for the ride. And I encounter a lot of people who feel this way, who are young. And I say, man, you need to be, you need to flip that around. And because you're, the quality of your material is your ultimate weapon. Mm. Boy, you know, I think John Mayer dealt with that a lot. You brought him up earlier, right? You know, Body is a Wonderland came out and and painted him into one category, and he's a handsome dude. Behind the scenes, I think he's a brilliant guitarist, one of the most ridiculously talented guitarists who didn't really get the recognition commercially. You know, I mean, a, a guitarist knew they're like, all right, this guy's a cat, you know, but he. Um, and then he he dealt with all the other sort of demons that came along with you know early success and everything. But but, but he's a re he's actually a really good songwriter. Yeah, well, like I I think um, again he's he sort of had the good roll of the dice too, right? He's a talented dude, dude just happens to be really handsome, you know, and uh, he's a white male in America, right? So there's a there's a little bit of a you know you, you get. A, the, the deck is stacked in your favor a little bit, but it's great that he has the talent to back it, right? So, but I, but but the thing is, I think that um, Johnny Lang, for example, is an amazing guitar player, yeah. really handsome guy, good singer. His songs are not as good as John's. He doesn't have as many good songs. Right. John's a triple threat. Being handsome works for him, but he's actually a good singer and actually a good songwriter and actually a strong guitar player, and so that's kind of undeniable. You know, many people get there in the in our business by not having all three of those. If you're really easy to look at and you're a great singer or you're really easy to look at and you're a great player, there's there's room for you. And then it, it's, you do you shoot yourself in the foot by having a bad attitude or you get a, you, bad luck. There's certainly people who are snake bit by the business in some way or another, and you can't figure out why they didn't become more popular than they did. But a lot of times that's their, of their own doing in some way or another. Um, but th there aren't a lot of people you can think of who are that good at that at all the things who don't come into the into, into your attention sure. uh, because yeah. he's really good at all those things. He deserves, yeah, he deserves the, sex, the success that he's had. Uh, you mentioned decency a couple of times. Uh, I talked a little bit about. Um, the legacy, you know, that, that some people leave behind and some people that can have kind of ruined their legacy by, you know, certain actions. I'm always interested to find out um, how 
you might envision yours. You know, you talked about maybe a relocation. Um, you, you've got, you've worn a lot of hats. How do you, do you, do you think about legacy at all? Or would you, what would you want people to remember? I would, I would, I, would honest, I mean, maybe if I think about it right now, but honestly, so I've never thought about it ever. Um, I, if I'm completely honest, I think I'm not done yet. Yeah. And I, I know it's a young people's business and uh, I'm not having, I never had a midlife crisis. It just, I didn't, I never felt that way. Um, and I certainly can't be having one now because it would be irrational for me to think I'm at the middle of my life. <laughs> so um, I still have the irrational optimism to feel that there are still cool things and, and better things to happen still ahead. Um, it, to that end, you know that I have a secret band. I did not know about the secret band. I have a secret band called Rosebank. Okay. Is and John it's Mayer your guitarist in this band. <laughs> hmm? Is John Mayer your guitarist in that band? <laughs> no, it's all songs. Uh, it, band is maybe the wrong word. There's a Rosebank record out. There's another okay. single coming out on the 13th of this month. And what it is, is all songs I wrote in the 80s that I never recorded all produced by some University of Miami graduates, some 20 somethings. And so it's sort of in the world of Tame Impala and the, the, and the 1973 and the, those sort of, it's that kind of record. Mm -hmm. So I'm the singer songwriter from back when I was chasing a record deal made 40 years later by a bunch of young cats that are in the, that school of thought now. No kidding. And we made the record during the pandemic and all I did was provide the songs and then agree somewhat foolishly and yet uh, ambitiously to sing them in the original keys. And they're not songs that were on my first record or that were on the Go 90 record or that some of the songs got played out, but I never ever recorded them. And now since it, it came out in late 20, um, I think this is probably the sixth single. I've just been releasing them slowly. And there's a music video for a song called So Many Words that I'm really proud of. And um, Anyway, it's really fun to have this pop, this sort of pop alter ego. Yeah. Right. Well, Garth did it, right? The Chris Gaines thing. Yeah. There, <laughs> there's the, the Craig Carruthers side of this. But, man, well, that, uh, you said April, or February 13th is when this. That's when the next single comes out. Okay. But there's several now that you can find on Spotify or Apple Music, any place like that. Just the one, all one word, Rose Bank. And it's really, I love, I've always really loved pop music, even though I play acoustic guitar most of the time. You know, I played bass in bands and, and I and I love, I've had bands that are sound very poppy and rocky, but most people know me as an acoustic guitar player. And so I think this idea of having this super modern pop record is not what anybody thinks to expect from me, which also, which is also fun. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as you've got the University of Miami students there, you know, working with you, right? You can yeah. you know, just, you can, you can tour and keep the generations, you know, like doing your music forever. You know, the, the, your, and then your... I'm also a video editor and, and uh, I, and that's really, really, really fun. But the weird thing is right now I have about three records in the can. I'm trying to decide what to do with, because I'm writing the best songs of my life. Nobody really buys CDs anymore. Music is a commodity that is not really one that, uh, that people are buying anymore. And so I'm still making records because it's just, I'm hardwired to write songs and then flesh them out in recordings. Um, but, and you know, I don't tour as much as I used to, partly because I don't have to, because I have this other gig. Um, partly because I have quite a few, you know, I've, I've had two spine surgeries and I also have an autoimmune disease. I've got, I've got quite a few. The pandemic for me was really easy because I'm sort of a hermit by nature unless I'm out on the road. And in May and June of just 23 was the first time I'd been out in four years to tour. Wow. Um, and I'm, you know, the thing was, I love it so much, but I didn't miss it. Yeah. I spent the first 23 years of my career playing five and six nights a week, four hours a night. Yeah. And then when I moved to Nashville and lost my publishing deal, I spent the next 10 years spending 180 days a year on the road. Wow. So staying at home and being able to work, you know, like this, I, I, you do this enough to know the, the, the artifice of this falls away. It just feels like we're sitting at the table talking to each other. That's it. Yeah. Absolutely. I, it doesn't, it's not, it's not weird for me anymore. People complain about it, but, 
it's incredibly practical. And for me, COVID could easily have killed me. And so I really needed to stay safe. And I still don't really go out to restaurants and I wear a mask when I go to the store because I am not going out that way. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I lost insane. I lost people to it, man. Recently, yeah. my, my brother-in-law so died in October from complications wow. of COVID. And Jesus, I it's, it's sorry, still out yeah. there. And people are just so blasé about it. They're tired of being careful. Yeah. But I, I don't have that luxury. But but I don't know what's going to happen next. I'm going to I'm going to put out one of these other records. One of them is a super poppy rock record. Uh, I'm toying with it being the second Rosebank record, but it's not quite the same. Um, I've got another acoustic record in the can. I've I've got another a, another different kind of record that I won't, won't go into, uh, which is really fun for me. I'm a really prolific writer and. I, you know, immodestly, I think I'm writing the best songs of my life now. Yeah, that makes sense. I've been I mean, getting... you've, you've, you've stayed true to your art and what moves you, right? And so that it doesn't seem like you've tried to write for what people out there would receive. It seems like this is... Well, just... I, I think when I came to Nashville, I started, I did a, a mistake that I made was to try to serve both masters. I wanted to write songs that were for me, but also for Nashville. And they turned out really being kind of neither. Hmm. Um, and then it took me a while to get back into my own zone after my, after I lost my publishing deal and to go back to writing by myself and to find my own natural voice. And, and then I just got on this jag of like, I've just been writing, I think really good songs now for quite a number of years. And one of the other things I'm pursuing, of course, is film and TV placements. I've had a song in Young Sheldon, had a song in a Netflix series called Cruel Summer, had a song in the first Knives Out movie. Uh, it's not a big revenue source, but it's another way to exploit music. And so I just got one in another indie film that I don't even know the name of that I found out from the, my sync agent. So I dig the teaching gig, but it, I, I, can't, I can't just do one thing. I'm, I'm too, I don't know. I'm too interested in too many things. I love to cook. I'm I'm a pretty handy remodeler. We're working on our house to get it ready to sell. Um, I love. I'm I'm a microphone junkie. I'm a pretty good engineer. I'm a, I, I do a lot of uh, design work. I do a lot of album covers for people. I, I have my. I like I like to do a lot of different things. Um, maybe being a songwriter and a singer is the thing that I've spent the most time doing that I may be arguably the best at. But I have all these other things that I love to do. So. I'm still, you know, chasing down new stuff. It, I think it makes you more well-rounded and probably appreciate your songwriting more too. You know, for me, I, I definitely wear a bunch of hats as well. And I think if I had to put all my eggs in one basket, it's not just the financial thing. It's creative space. You know, I just enjoy yeah. know, spreading myself out a little bit. I wish I had a better handy, you know, sense inside of myself. And I wish I was a better cook too, but that just take some practice you know and you know the thing is anything other than the things that you just you you were accidentally good at by some dent of dna or whatever everything that anybody's good at they had to learn how to do and the more time you spend on anything the better you get at it so i think what that means is if anybody who had to learn who knows how to do something had to learn how to do it doesn't that mean that you can learn how to do anything absolutely yeah. so i did a lot more cooking during the pandemic and you know why not yeah. um i'm studying spanish my spanish is very weak but i think americans are really lame about being monolingual right i'm studying uh, more music theory that i've always felt like i didn't really need it but i'm really interested and fascinated by some of the sophisticated harmonies that i don't understand that i am moved by but can't speak uh fluently about nice. um and it's really helped me, I think, as a songwriter. I, I think when you have to teach something, you gain a mastery of it that you didn't have before you had to try to make it understandable to somebody else. And so I think being a songwriting teacher has helped me become a better songwriter, too. I'll bet. The students are fortunate, nearly, man. I, um, what, you know, I talked about legacy and decency. Oh, uh, for me, there was this quote that Jim Carrey gave to it's become viral it's been around for a while like 10 15 years ago he i guess he was doing a keynote speech for marketing students i think at stanford and th their whole goal right is to go out and write and, and and craft ways to make money and he said the effect you have on others is the greatest form of currency there is you know and that was to set them out on their their path you know just don't lose sight of what was really important having that effect on other people and 
you and I talked about it with Tim and you talked about it with uh, certain songwriters and other people that you, you come across that um, that light. You, you mentioned Dolly. I had Stella, Dolly's sister, on my show early on. And um, she talked about this this beautiful spirit that the, the three sisters had, you know, that they had nothing in their life, you know, in terms of toys or, or, you know, uh, just, um, possessions. They grew up, they quote unquote dirt poor, but they had song and they had love in their family, you know, and it just, um, it's, it's so warm to just picture that, right. Just to see somebody that just brings that kind of joy and, and it, it, like closing your eyes or even she looks so much like her sister and she sounds identical to her sister. Yeah. She's got over 40 records. I don't know if you know Stella at all, but I know I don't know her personally, but of course I know who she is. Wonderful, wonderful woman. And it just um it just made me again, it gives me hope the way, you know, some of the other people we talked about that there are people in a somewhat insidious industry, you know, that can go out and have a really beautiful, profound impact on people in a great way. Yeah. You, you know the the thing about it is it's we talk we're talking a few times like the Jim Carrey thing or Dolly Parton about the about the impact and almost the surprise of people with with colossal notoriety and wealth but being this way but there's a lot of people you know it might be the nurse practitioner at your place it might be your 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 kid's fourth grade teacher there's a lot of people walking this talk and I think it's easy to lose sight of how many, and this is one of the problems I have with, you know, and I, I think I was guilty of this, you know, this whole idea that the middle of the country is the flyover states. The, 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 the two-dimensional notion that people on the West Coast and the East Coast have about the heartland, I played a lot in Missouri and, and uh, I, I played in Montana and I, and I played in Colorado and I played in Texas. And, I, and the thing is, Everybody, even we have so many things that we disagree about and we define ourselves by those, but everybody wants to be safe and everybody wants their kids to be safe. Everyone wants to have enough to eat and they want to have opportunity. And I know people like, well, and, and Tim's a good example of this too. Tim and I didn't agree about hardly anything except music and responsibility. Mm, yeah. I'm not a religious person. I'm ultra, ultra left. I don't have any kids. Tim, very Catholic, very Republican. I don't know if you do that about him. Yeah. And, and, and six children. Yeah. So we didn't, we didn't see the world in the same way, but that all got checked at the door because our relationship was not about that. Right. Same with some of my best friends that, that I've met in the world. One of, one of my best friends is now a judge in, in uh, Des Moines. And he grew up uh, in the Catholic Church, and he grew up and was in the army, and he was a Republican. And I could not love the guy more. And we just we just have the best relationship. But he is also one of the Republicans who's very disillusioned with what's happened. He says, "I I don't feel like I can call myself a Republican anymore." Right. You know that that's sort of went away. And I, you and I sort of talked about that we would probably steer clear of religion and politics. But the, I think that when I was a kid people who disagreed with each other could still talk to each other. Yeah, yeah. And I think this idea that, and I think the internet hasn't helped with this. I don't know if you've seen the, uh, what's his name? Colin Quinn thing about America. It's astonishing. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. It's probably on Netflix. And he says that the internet is a little bit like when the lights come up at last call, mm -hmm. suddenly you see who you've been talking to. Yeah. And we were much more tolerant of each other when we knew less about each other. Sure. But it's been the opposite for me. I go and I play in South Dakota, and many of those people I don't agree with about so much, but they come out and they love songs and they like to laugh. And we have a wonderful experience because it's not about that. And I don't think politics or religion is not my platform when I'm uh, as a writer player. Sure. I want to be like the movie you go to to forget about the rest of yeah. the, you know, to have a yeah. singular experience that's rewarding, that's not put rubbing your face in the things that are bothering you on the day-to-day -day basis. I, I don't feel like that's my job. I know that there are people who do feel that that's your job and more power to them, but it's not my job. It's not what I want my job to be. I don't, I don't care what your political or religious uh, affiliations are. If you're coming to the show and giving 
giving it a chance and, and enjoying yourself. Who cares about any of that other stuff? That shouldn't matter. Right. I, I got a great idea for a bumper stick, bumper sticker, which is, but it takes up the whole bumper. If you have a political or religious opinion, keep it to yourself. It's a recipe for world peace. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're going to have to use some small font to get that on or a big, big truck. Yeah, but, that's right. Yeah. I, mean, I have a couple of cars driving next to each other. It's like, yeah. Right. Passing it on. Well, you know what, man? I mean, that is what it's all about. Music is certainly a transcendent thing. It helps bridge, you know, those differences. And, you know, I've heard so many, it, heard it said so many different ways that we are all the same underneath. You know, you talked about the common things that we all inherently want, regardless of partisan politics or, or religious upbringing. I mean, common decency, right? That's what it's about. And being good to each other, good human beings. And I am, um, I felt that the first time I saw you play, like I said, when I first saw you and Tim play together, I felt like I was invited into the secret, you know, backyard party. And uh, uh, even though it may not have mattered to you guys, whether or not. Anybody no, but thanks for saying, because I do want everyone to feel included at a show. I mean, I think that is a big part of my goal. Yeah. I, I, I enjoy it. And I enjoy that connection and, that sort of feeling that we're in on something together. Everybody likes that feeling. Yeah. It, well, you feel inclusive. It, it didn't seem overt. It really felt, it didn't seem contrived. It felt sincere. You know, it really did feel. Well, like it is. I'm glad to hear that because it isn't yeah. contrived. It's just genuine. It's when I've had that experience at somebody else's show, it, the feeling you get from it is incredible. Yeah. And yeah. I remember approaching a few musicians early in my career who I really thought the world of, and they were so rude and standoffish. And I would, and I would say to myself, if, if anybody ever comes up to me to talk to me at a show, if I'm ever so lucky that somebody wants to come talk to me or ask me for a song, what a, what a wonderful thing that will be. And I want to make them, I want to make them, I, I want them to feel like that was a good experience for them. I want to go home and go, yeah, I talked to him. He was really nice. And he talked to me after the show. I, I just don't ever want to be that other person. Yeah. And, and, and it, I, I've, I've been perceived to be that other person a couple of times by people. And it really was disappointing to me because I, I, I still don't think under those circumstances that I was that person, but sometimes the expectations people have of how much of you they get, you know, like I, if I have a 15 minute break and I'm trying to sell records and somebody comes up and stands in front of everyone just to tell me a story and I want to talk to them. And then I say, hey, man, can we pick this up after the gig? Because I'm going to try. And then, oh, OK, fine. Like, OK, well, I can't win under those circumstances. Right. I'm trying to be cool about it, but they're not really paying attention to how it works. Yeah. I will stay after the gig and talk to somebody, you know, but but in that brief window, like there's other people. I haven't been in Portland for a while. There's other people who want to say hi also. And you're just sort of acting like you're the only one who gets to hold the mic. Right. And yeah. and then I'm the jerk for taking it away from you. I'm glad that those instances are few and far between now. Really, you know, because I mean, they, yeah, oh, I, I who knows? There's probably countless people who think I'm an arrogant asshole. You never know. I've never heard that, actually. And, and I think um, when, you know, when you talked about your induction in the Oregon Music Hall of Fame, to me, those are the people that really stand out to me, too. You know, I was... I, I still have a hard time with, with receiving this, but in 22, I was inducted and I had, a, I had this imposter syndrome, you know, I felt really weird about it. And Terry said, you know, it's about so much more, you know, it's about the way that you relate to the community and what you give it yeah. back. And, and I am very grateful to have people feel that way. Cause I really do feel so much respect and admiration for those people that when we go out and we play shows, I want to make sure that everybody feels included. I'm very vocal to, to, you know, make sure that I appreciate and I'm grateful for all the people that are there. Sometimes you mentioned some people that are feeling like they want more, you know, we've all been there, right? Where you, you've not been to Portland, like you said, and you come back into Portland and a thousand people that you haven't talked to in a couple of years want to be on your guest list, you know, and you think, um, you know, I mean, I, yeah, if I, you know, if if it were no thing, you know, I'd, I'd try to guest as many people as I could. But hey, you know, re realistically, we haven't even talked in ten years. You know, thanks for the phone call, but um, you know, I, this makes me think of something really funny. 
I sent out my mailing list. Well, this is probably 10 years ago about coming to Portland. And some somebody responded, wrote back to me saying, oh, I'm really excited you're coming. I'm going to ask my friend if they want to go. And then that email went to the friend and the friend used the oh so deadly reply all button. The reply all button must be deleted from all. It's too dangerous. Right. Yeah. So the reply from her friend was, oh, I love his music, but he's a little too full of himself for me. Ooh. And I just I just erupted in laughter on this end. And so I emailed her. I don't know who she is. I said, I'm mortified that this is what you think of me. Will you please give me a chance to change your mind about it? Will you please come to the show as my guest? And her friend said, when you she got that email from you, she was so embarrassed that you had read that she's not coming to the show. And I go, well, that's oh. too bad. So I have no chance to to try to you know win her over with a charm yeah. offensive. But I just made me laugh so hard because I know she didn't know I was getting that email. Yeah, it was so oh. funny. God, that um, the the kill him with kindness thing. I'm obviously not an original member of a flock of seagulls. It's a band from Liverpool. The band you know formed in early or late seventies drummer's been out for a long time and there's this online Facebook group called fans of the original flock of seagulls. And I'm a fan of the original band. I'm grateful, you know, to be filling the seat that, you know, paved the way and, and, you know, I really appreciate the songs and I really enjoy watching the banter from, you know, like uh, armchair quarterbacks that are out there yeah, right, right. and dogging every, you know, member that's not the original founding four and in a big way. And, we happen most of them are based in Liverpool, the the fans that put that group together. And I said, Hey, we're we're coming to the Cavern Club. I know a bunch of you guys are there. If you feel like coming out, I'd love to meet you and kind of share old stories about your love for the band. And if you come to the show and you really don't have a good time, I'll give you your money back. And a bunch of them came out to the show and had a table right up towards the front of the stage. And they're sitting, arms crossed, they're watching. And afterwards, I said, you guys had a good time? And they're like, man, ah, we feel like assholes, you know, for the stuff that we were posting. Like, you made the show really fun. You totally disarmed us all by actually just, you know, reaching out with an olive branch. We kind of wanted to come and hate you, but it was a different show than we expected, but it was a lot more fun than we expected. So thank you. Now, they're an advocate online. So when they have that group and somebody else will come in and sort of dog, they're an advocate instead of an adversary. Yeah. And our, my singer was like, don't engage, don't talk to him. And I said, I think I can do this in a diplomatic way. I really yeah. do. I think this is, this can work. And a lot of that just comes from respect because you see people battling on Facebook all the time or, or social media in general, right? Where they, they just need to be right. And I don't need to be right. I'm just grateful for, and appreciative for all the opportunities we get. You know? Oh, weighing in. I mean, you can't do that. If somebody it, it, it says something snotty about me on Facebook or Instagram, there's, there's no, there's no reason to weigh into that. It's a little bit like the, you, you can't win in conversations about religion and politics. Yeah. I, you know, I will just say something like, sorry, you feel that way or, or nothing. And if it's too hostile, then I just will delete the thread or whatever, you know, it's just like I made the mistake early on of engage, of engaging and it just, it just spins. You get really frustrated and angry while it spins out of control while you're arguing with someone who's essentially not there's not a conversation going on yeah. they're just continuing to escalate their particular rhetoric yeah and it's not about winning right because you're not even going to have an open dialogue right they're not it's not like you're going to get them to say oh well i see your perspective on it that <laughs> no, never happens that, right? that virtually never well not in that forum every now and then you can have a conversation with someone i you know i was in sweden and I was, this doesn't happen here very often, but I was sitting in Sweden and I was sitting at this table and the two women, there was a bunch of us were musicians and the two women I was sitting with, they said, well, where do you live in the United States? And I said, um, well, here's where New York is. And I was using like silverware and stuff and I made a map of the United States. I go, here's where New York is and here's where Hollywood is. You know where those are, right? And I go, well, I live here in Nashville, which is blah, 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 it's down here in this part of the country. Oh, and a woman at an adjacent table, she goes, that is not what America looks like. That is a terrible map. That is not the shape of the United States. <laughs> and so I just decided, listen, I finally learned, don't fight everybody. I just went, okay, all right. And here's the weird part. About 10 minutes later, she comes back over and she says, I would like to apologize. That is a very accurate map of the United States. I, 
I have looked it up in my phone. And as you can see, and she set her phone down next to my map and it was like spot on. Wow. And she goes, I don't know what I was thinking, but I'm terribly sorry. Wow. Good How often her. does that happen here Not where, where people will come back for it and own their own pomposity yeah. and apologize for it? It was, it was yeah. crazy cool. That's, I mean, again, a lesson in accountability. You know, you talked about students and other people, but yeah, you know, hopefully there could be sort of a, you know, a movement for that. I mean, accountability is such a huge thing for me, you know, again, I mean, personal takes- responsibility. That's yeah. the thing we ought to all be able to agree on. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Man, you know, if when, when you decide that you're done teaching songwriting, can you just teach a course in personal responsibility? Would that be? <laughs> That's, That's what I am teaching at college. It's just masquerading as songwriting and lyric writing. You know what? You talked about the differences you had from Tim, but how much you guys connected. He was without trying. Well, actually, he was very opinionated, but uh, but he did sort of continue the education and personal responsibility all the time. You know, I really, what a, what an amazing role model for his six kids. You know, I've yeah. talked to Tiffany, his daughter about that a lot and the documentary she did on her dad, yeah. you know, I mean, it was a, an incredible, incredible yeah. piece. And a lot, you know, even if you didn't know Tim, what an amazing film about an amazing human being. Yeah. Right? I just, I, uh, I am so grateful for him he made me not only such a better drummer and musician but a much better human being you know it was it was um, like there are only you know we should all be so lucky to have people impact our lives like that i'm really you know he's one of two or three people i knew in my life that was almost like i I don't really believe i'm not really a magical or a or a, a supernatural believer um but it's almost you know he was playing in every band and making every recording and 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 raising six kids and starting another business and golfing and just doing everything it's almost like on some level he knew he had to get it get a lifetime's worth out sooner than you might expect and i knew another person like that in high school who started he and his girlfriend got pregnant between the junior and seniors of high school and he started a, a painting company and started painting houses. And by the time he graduated from high school, he had a crew and they, he and his wife had started out as his girlfriend. When they graduated, they bought a duplex and remodeled one side while they lived in the other. And then he kept he had this painting company and then they kept painting houses. And at 23, he died of brain cancer, but his, but by then they owned 11 houses. Wow. And so he, she and their two kids, I believe it might have been three, they were fine. I mean, obviously devastated. Right, of course. But, but it, was, it was almost like on some level he knew he needed to get all this accomplished. I think it's kind of eerie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There are there are no accidents, man. There are no coincidences, right? There, I, I, Who knows? Yeah, it's a beautiful story, man. I mean, you know, I, I but um, I'm glad that you can relay some of that stuff too. I mean, good for, for people to know not to take things for granted, you know, just take every minute and enjoy and appreciate it. I, I never knew a busier person than Tim. Actually, one of our early conflicts was he so show up at the last possible second. And I said, I love you to death, but I can't, it doesn't work for me. Yeah. You got to, you got to get here at least 20 minutes before the downbeat or let's stop playing together. And then he was never late again, ever. Really? Man, which is not his reputation. <laughs> no, I, I, I can't even, I can't think of a gig that he was ever. Early. Well, actually, the, the big corporates, he was always early. But yeah, man, every every casual that he did. <laughs> we we played a casual with. He was playing with Michael Harrison, and the gig came up, and and the bass player couldn't make the gig, and so Tim said, "Come on, you got to play bass at the Michael Harrison gig." I said, "I don't know the book," and he goes, "No, I'll yell out every chord change," <laughs> and so he did. I played the whole night with him going D, F, A minor, <laughs> like through the entire night. It was, we were laughing so hard. Oh my God. You even do his voice really well. That's impressive, man. That's, uh, yeah, we could, you know, we could probably assemble a crew and have, you know, an episode on Tim Ellis and just never, ever quit, you know, but yeah. it's, uh, well, God bless Tim, man, for, for, you know, being that impact. 
Yeah. I, I'm most impressed that we made it uh, through this entire conversation. You didn't once have to pull the fire alarm. I'm really grateful for that. <laughs> but, uh, it's th- my light switch. Oh, nice. Isn't I that great? Love it. Oh, that's great, man. That, well, you know. This is where I'm set up to do my classes. And I had a white switch cover there. And it was really annoying. And I thought, I want to put something there to make the dress that up. Yeah. And then I found those that just made me laugh really hard. And then I thought, and then a friend of mine said, oh, well, you know, there's always a fire alarm in the classroom. And so I thought, oh, how perfect. Yeah, I love it, man. I, that's good stuff. I just realized my backdrop, that one back there, I think that's that's you, right? I think that was the first induction ceremony poster of the Oregon Music Hall of Fame. So I, I don't have that poster. I, 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 I probably not gettable anymore. Yeah, well, Gary Houston, man, amazing. But well, yeah, I'll snap a picture. You can, uh, you can have that. Please do. But uh, um, man, Craig Carruthers, dude, I, I miss your face, and I'm hopeful. You know, when, uh, when you disclose your relocation plans, that I get a chance to see you in person. Maybe come out. Catch a live show and do a little, uh, you know, I'll do a lesson of personal responsibility and I'll just be quiet and watch your show. And then, uh, but, but you, uh, I, you well, know, I really, I would love to hear you play again. I miss you. you know? I'll definitely be playing in the Northwest. You know, I, the pandemic kept me away a lot, but when I came back, the, the, the audiences were so wonderful when I was there in May and June. Uh, I'll definitely be back sometime in the summer, probably. Right on. Awesome. Guys, if you if you uh, if you got here late and didn't realize um, what an amazing, phenomenal human being this is, um, you can find out more. Go to the best bio writer. Uh, I don't know if you crafted your own bio, but it was the greatest biography on uh, on on anybody's website, CraigCarruthers dot com. Uh, please go to YouTube, subscribe to this channel, like it, share it. I've got uh, another amazing songwriter. Um, he's a his, his Emmys are mostly daytime Emmy awards. He's uh, he's been a songwriter for and music director and sound designer for a lot of daytime TV shows. Uh, but he happened to be the keyboardist from my old band, Animotion, way back in the day, uh, Paul Antonelli. And um, so he's the Monday, 5 o'clock Pacific, 8 o'clock Eastern. So subscribe to the channel. And uh, please wish Mr. Craig Carruthers fantastic evening thank your wife for sharing your evening with me man i really appreciate it my my better three quarters as i like to call her yeah nice well i'll give her my best too and I sure uh, will. Yeah, i'm grateful to see your face man you are a you're a beautiful human being brother well thank you kevin it's so nice for you to invite me and it's really fun chatting thank you all right guys have a good one we'll see you after super bowl 